for our YouTube people. All right, so let's get into it. So the 2017 release, you know, what's it about? What did we do? How's it going to affect your workflow? You know, the last time we changed the interface was back in 2005 going into 2006 when we went from the 9 to the X interface. And, you know, there was a lot of pushback to that because we were on the version 9 type interface from basically ver Mastercam version 7 through 9, which is about 1995 through 2005. So it was about 10 years and it was quite a drastic change and we tried to get people up to speed as much as we could but there were still the people you know that were diehard version 9 fans and the done done do it sort of workflow and never really converted so part of our goal with this update to the interface was to not alienate current users but also trying to make it easier and more of a modern interface for new customers and kids in school and stuff like that to pick it up. And the feedback I've gotten so far is, you know, it is a change, but people are transitioning a lot more quickly than they did with the version 9 to X switch over. And hopefully some of the stuff I go over today as far as customizing the interface will allow you guys to set up the system the way that you like to use it and for your, your particular job or shop and uh, really really make it as effective as possible for you because at the end of the day you know that's what our software is here to do is you know to reduce that print to part time as I call it and make your company a better manufacturing facility so while we did change the interface we did want to focus you know not just on you know slapping a new face on Mastercam we're always looking to improve the product so there are over 120 new features in there and I will jump to the internet one more time here I will probably a bunch of times throughout the webinar here but if you go to what's new dot mastercam dot com you'll get basically a full list of anything that we change in the software and if it's a real technical change there'll be a longer blurb on it and maybe a video you can also download the PDF here to take with you or read on your iPad or something like that And we've also gone to a public beta format. And what that has allowed us to do is really focus on the quality of the software. And I know we got some knocks on that. You know, back in the mid-2000s, mid we had a private beta program. There wasn't a lot of people testing it. And when it kind of hit the field and you guys started using it is when we started learning about these things we need to fix as fast as possible. So we've had a lot of good beta testing, both you know in our territory and just throughout the Mastercam community. And from what we've seen so far in 2017, it's been a pretty solid, solid release. I haven't really had any calls about anything that's really sort of game breaking as far as the interface or creating your G code at the end of the day is. And from surveys that Mastercam has been doing to the beta community, people are reporting it takes about two two days of regular use to get up to speed on the new interface. You know, obviously it's going to take you a little bit longer than that to, you know, become a pro's pro at the new interface, but it's a pretty fast adjustment from what we've been seeing. So kind of some general information on what we've done to the interface is we've adopted the Microsoft family of Hi, Jeff. Jeff, our owner's here now. Everyone say hi. Um, he gets to crit critique my webinar skills. But um, so we got the, the Microsoft ribbon interface into the software. And so if you've used anything like SolidWorks to Microsoft Office, it's kind of the way that software interfaces are going these days and to organize your workflow but it also allows us to really customize and all those tabs across the top you can turn them on off create ones the way you want you can still customize the right click menu to your heart's content and we'll get into that a little bit more here so just kind of going over the general layout of the interface here so we have what's called the ribbon at the top now you might remember the ribbon bar from the x 
interface, you know, that's where you typed in your values for drawing lines or any sort of command. But the ribbon now is actually the top main menu across the top. And I'm just going to kind of go over the naming of all these so you guys are familiar if like the help file or something tells you where to lo locate something, you'll, you'll know right away where that is. So we have the ribbon across the top, and then you have different tabs for the various commands, and they're all named accordingly. And then we have the what we call contextual tab group. So when you pick a mill machine defin definition, for instance, it's going to pop up with all the available mill tool paths. And I'm also going to get into a little bit on how you can customize that and have different menus pop up when you pull a mill machine def. Like if you're a mill level one or a mill standard, now it's called customer. You know, you don't necessarily want to see all the 3D and multi-axis tool paths and really have the tool paths that are geared towards your level of the software. And the tool paths are grouped into what's called galleries. And they are smart. So tool paths you use more often will move to the beginning of the list. And ones you use less often will get start to get pushed down. And then so all your what's called general selection has been moved into the graphical window and you'll notice if you mouse over it it'll it'll dim or get get more bright as your mouse is over it. And you can also set that dim setting in the configuration where if you don't want to see it at all and you kind of know where to move your mouse you can have it basically completely disappear when you're not active over it. And then on your right hand side, as opposed to being a toolbar, like in the X interface, you have what's called the quick masks, where the left half is all and the right half of these little circles are only. And if you remember the old all or only button from X9 or any of the X versions, a lot of people use that. The all or only is actually this gear icon right above the un unselect button here in the bottom right. And then anytime you right click in the graphical interface, you are going to get the mini toolbar, we call it. And so the top of it is going to be all your entity attributes. So that's line width, clear, clear colors, move things to different levels, set the colors of different parts of geometry, and so forth. You can also click this little blue arrow in the right-hand corner here, and that will dock this menu to a static window, and you can kind of Move it to the bottom of the screen if you want, and then it'll be more similar to the X interface where your attributes are always visible. And then the rest of your right-click menu is the same as it was in the X version where it's customizable and you can set whatever you want. And then lastly, you have the quick access toolbars at the very top. So you can add any command here up to the top. And if you're a hotkey user like me, and you press the Alt key to bring up the hotkeys, Anything in the quick access toolbar will be assigned a number. So you, you can hit like Alt 2, I think by default, is the, the save icon. And then when you click the file menu, you get what's called the backstage menu that kind of takes you out of the graphical interface and kind of all the housekeeping items as far as the software goes. So this is where your configuration is towards the bottom of the list there. You have the community tab, the help tab. This is where you create a zip to go, where you do file open. And you also have the convert tab here is where you do like your file migration of posts or tool libraries or anything like that. So I really kind of talked about all this as far as the ribbon bar tabs and groups go. So I think you guys have a good idea of that. So I'll skip past that slide. So let's get into a little bit on customizing the ribbon here. And I have a little video recorded, but I think it'll be easier for you guys to see it inside the actual interface as opposed to a PowerPoint. So this is the interface here. I have mine set up exactly as how you would get it if you were to install 2017 for the first time. And that actually reminds me, let's uh, launch a poll real quick here to see how many of you are currently using 2017 or what version you guys are using. So let me click launch poll here. And you guys should be seeing on your screen now, uh, yeah, looks like it's working. So you can just answer which version you're currently using. 
Looks like we're at about a third of you are on are using 2017, and the other two thirds are using X9. So there are a lot of guys in here that really haven't used 2017 yet. So I'll try to be as you know thorough as possible, so you guys can start giving it a try. And it looks like most everyone has voted, so I'm going to close the poll here. Thanks for voting. So the only thing I've customized as far as the interface comes from default is I've made a darker background. I'm not a big fan of the light background that all these softwares comes with. come with these days. I think it's partly due to my terrible eyes. But if I right-click anywhere up in the toolbars here, I can say customize the ribbon. And that will take me to basically this options menu that is really all the graphical interface customization that's not what I would consider Mastercam specific. So setting colors, line width, and stuff like that, that's still all in the Mastercam configuration and menu, and I'll show you guys that as well. But so you have your quick access toolbar here to customize. You can add any command you want. And from this pull down here, you can select the category and then pick the command you want to the quick access menu. But in the customize the ribbon tab here, and I actually have this, what I would call ribbon state or ribbon customization file, which is actually the dot workspace file available for download on our 2017 download page. So people can give it a try. But basically what I did here is if I go to, in, instead of main tab, so the main tabs are what's always visible even when you don't have a machine definition selected. So, you know, that's wireframe, surface, solids, model prep, and so forth. But if I go to all tabs here, it'll also, if I scroll down, will bring up my tool pass specific tabs. So I have, you know, for lathe, I have both turning and milling. And then you'll see here, I created a custom toolbar called mill standard. So if I turn on mill standard and turn off the default tool pass tab and say, okay, now if I go to my machine tab here, and click mill and let's just pick the default it's going to pick up my custom toolbar as opposed to the one that i that comes with mastercam by default and i have this one set up to do all the standard 2d tool paths in the same gallery format that you guys would see in the regular workspace but then since all the mill one customers i'm doing some air quotes you guys can't see over the webinar basically got upgraded to mill level two with the release of X9, I have all the buttons that are the 3D tool paths that are available to you as a mill standard customer. So you have two tool paths that are multi-surface. So that's multi-surface pocket, which is basically a back and forth 3D roughing operation, and then finish parallel. And then all the other 3D tool paths are limited to a single surface or a single solid face. But it gives you quite a bit of you know, 3D capability even in the standard mill software. But you know, if you're making molds or still have complex 3D parts, you know, mill, mill 3D still is the way you're going to want to go. And I also customize the utilities menu here to take out some of the multi-axis stuff that people won't need. So let me show you guys where that is. So if you, got to, if you go to our website, and if I reload it for the first time here, I'll have a, there, there's a slide on 2017. You can scroll here and say click for what's new in 2017 and to download, or it's in the menus at the top. Now there's some highlights, there's a link to the what's new, but if you go to the 2017 downloads page, I already entered my password, but the password is always our company name and whatever the current version is. So the password for this page is shopware without the INC and then 2017. And then you have the links to download the main 2017, Mastercam for SolidWorks, if you have SolidWorks or have that product. And then I have all these extras downloads. So I have a kind of a training PDF on making the switch that corporate made that's pretty nice. Um, the art download. You'll also notice that the manufacturer tool libraries are not in 2017. They're a separate download, and they're also available on the Mastercam website, which I'll get in that towards the end, just based on time here. Because we want to be able to keep those more up to date, you know, as ISCAR, for example, comes out with new tools, 
back in like X9, when you installed X9 and it downloaded or it installed the ISCAR tool library, you were set with whatever ISCAR tools were available at the day of release, as opposed to being a more up-to-date and live tool database that you can download. There's the command finder here. This is a good help for people transitioning to 2017. I'll show you guys in a second on how that works. But there's some instructions on here to install it. And it's basically kind of like a live Google search for any command in the software. And it allows you to find something so you don't have to necessarily hunt for it as you learn the new interface. And then the last thing here I have is this mill standard custom workspace is the one I showed you just now in the software. And that particular file, if I go to my start button and then go to documents, and I have my my documents, but then you're also going to have your, your shared, but all the system configuration is in your my MCAM 2017 folder. So you go to my documents, my MCAM 2017, and then the config folder. And then this is actually an enhancement request that was filed by me. In 2017, you can't necessarily switch workspaces on the fly, but there is kind of a workaround for it. If you have mastercam.workspace in the root of the config folder, that'll pull your current way the mastercam system works. And then you can make a folder in there called other workspaces, and then you can have anything you want. Like I had a molding customer of mine send me his workspace because he said he spent a ton of time customizing it specifically to molding. And I'm kind of running it through its paces now to see if it's good enough to put on that 2017 downloads page. But anything you move then, move out of the config folder and into like this subfolder, then you can switch back and forth between workspaces as you work on trying to customize them to the way that you guys run the software. So I went over customizing there a bit. Do we have any questions, Ryan? I didn't see any pop up. Okay. So customizing the quick access toolbar works the same. I won't go into the software for this. I think the video should be kind of slow enough so you guys can see it. But it works the same way as adding things to the custom tabs. And one thing I will show you guys in the software, with any new you know, Windows 7 or Windows 10 program, Microsoft requires you hit the Alt key to activate the hotkeys. So you'll see there, if I hit the Alt, it toggles all those kind of gray black boxes with the letter there. So, for example, if I hit Alt W for wireframe and then E for lines, and then it brings up the line command. And then that command finder I was talking about, let's go through the same scenario. So it's on the Home tab here, and then it's Run Add-ins, which a lot of us know as a C hook. You can also hit Alt and then the letter C to bring up your C hooks menu. And once you drop that file from our website into the folder here, so it's um, program files, Mastercam 2017, and then the C hooks folder. So all, all you do is drop that command finder DLL into that folder and then say open. And you can leave this open throughout the session. So if you have dual screens, you can put it on the other screen. You can put it towards the bottom of the window. But if I start typing in something here, like let's say line, it'll start coming up with all the available commands that have the word line in it. And if it's a command that kicks me into a function to say create something, it'll go right into that command. So for line endpoints here, if I click on it, double click, sorry, it'll kick me right into the line end, endpoint command and I can start drawing, for instance. And if I want to close out of it, I can just close out of it here. So one other thing as far as customizing the workspace, if any of you guys have used the tool manager, for instance, or any of you that have the mill turn, this new Microsoft.net basically allows us to drag the windows anywhere we want. So you'll notice down here that we've moved a couple things, and I believe I have some slides coming up on these, but your tool path, solids, levels, planes, and recent functions are all now in here. I should turn off my Dropbox notifications. But um, so I can take my tool pass, for example, here, and I can drag this out. I can move it onto a different window. I saw some corporate people when we, we were getting some dealer training on 2017. Some of them like to run 
half of these on the right half of the screen and the other half on the left half, kind of depending on how they work. And it'll give you a preview of where you're going to dock this stuff. So if I use the ones in the center, it'll kind of stack it on top of the existing menus. But if I drag it over to the left here, it'll, it'll put it on the left half of that. Now, if I drag it out and put it into here, that's where it puts it onto there. Or lastly, if I drag it on top of the other commands in here, it'll put it back in group with these other windows. And one other tip on as far as these windows work, you can get a lot more what I call graphical space on 2017 if you click the auto hide button here in uh, what I call the manager's pane. And then I can also right click up here and say minimize the ribbon. So now I can basically make my screen the entire graphics view without necessarily having any of the menus in the way. If I hover over tool paths or solids, for example, they kind of fan out. These menus at the top, I have to actually click on to get them to turn on. But as soon as I click away from it, it will go away. Or if I were to go into a specific command, it'll go away as well. Now, I have a pretty big laptop with a 1080p screen, so I don't necessarily leave this stuff unpinned. But depending on your screen or how you want to set it up, I thought that was pretty handy. So we went in a bit to the customizing here. I don't want to kind of beat this too much with a dead horse. I think you guys probably get an idea. Or if I was going a little too fast for some of that customization options, feel free to watch the recording after this. Or you know, give any of our tech support guys a call and they'd be happy to do a go-to meeting and show you guys a little bit more on how you can customize the interface. And I talked about the file locations. So it's in your my documents, my MCAM 2017, and then config. And one other thing, when I, when I click the customize the ribbon, that's also available in this backstage menu under what's called the options here. So if I click on options, that kicks me into the same customization. If I click on file here and click on configuration, that's where I get into the standard system config that you guys are used to using from previous versions of MasterCam. And this is pretty much the same as you'd see in X9. You know, there were some things that are different with the new interface, but like the start exit tab to set it to the Simcoe editor is the same, which I know a lot of people do. And since we did go to the old interface, your toolbar menu will not transfer over. The one file that will transfer over is your key map file. So if you have a lot of hotkeys or a power key user, you, you can mi migrate that over. Oh yeah, the right mouse button menu. So we did find this out and it's not, Ryan was telling me about this just now, it's not officially supported by MasterCam, but we've been trying it here and it's been working just fine. If you actually migrate that MTB file, it will bring over your right mouse click menu because I have seen customers where they basically have the entire interface under the right mouse click and you can bring that over so you don't have to bring, spend all that time setting that up. So this is just a review of the parts of the interface we were talking about here. You know, we got the gallery selection bar, shortcuts, we covered all that. See, I'm getting ahead of myself. I've done this presentation too many times now where I start talking about things before I get to the slide, but no one's a huge fan of PowerPoint, I know. We talked about what's new.mastercam.com a bit. The, there's also some things now, if you link your account on mastercam.com, you can um, access some additional information on the Mastercam website. So let's talk about that a little bit. I'll go back to my browser. Now, if we're on the Mastercam website here, you do the linking under File, and then is it Help, Ryan? I haven't linked mine yet on here. OK, sorry, it's on the Community tab, Link Account. Now, if you're on a NetHasp, there's a blog post on our website that walks you through it. Or you know, just call anyone at the office and we can get your account linked. Because if you're on a NetHasp, you know, multiple people are 
using the same quote unquote linking code to create an account on mastercam.com. But if we go to help here, we also have these available on our website, but you have some tutorials on mastercam.com. There's the Mastercam forum that you can get access to where people talk about different top topics and throw things off each other. This used to be on eMastercam for anyone that's been around for a while, but that's kind of gone away as Mastercam Corporate has started their own forum. And most of the guys that were on eMastercam, e you know, with the 10,000 plus posts type of guys, they've all moved over to this forum too. One other thing that I want to talk about while we're here anyways, if you go to communities and then events, which that's sparking me to launch our next poll, who's coming to IMTS next week? It's always a fun event. My feet hurt at the end of the week for standing for seven straight days, but let's see who's all coming. Because we'd love for you to stop by. You know, there's going to be some swag for current customers there. Um, and one thing I'm going to talk about here there is going to be an opportunity to win a free seat of Mastercam Mill with, there's a little bit of leg legwork involved, but uh, honestly, I think it's pretty easy for winning something that has, you know, like a $6,800 street value. But if you go to communities, events, and then click on IMTS here to the left. Oh, I got to close the poll, sorry. Okay, now you guys can see my screen. So if I go to communities, events, and then on the left-hand side here, you'll see IMTS. They're what they're calling the IMTS scavenger hunt. And it's a PDF, and you can download this from the Mastercam website. But basically, we have a bunch of partners at IMTS, and we have all their booth numbers at the bottom of the sheet. So basically, what you have to do is if you have Instagram or Twitter, or you can sign up for one of those accounts really easily, and I know some people are probably anti-social media, but you can create a dummy account just for the point of this. But if you go to all these booths and basically take a photo of yourself in the booth and use that Mastercam Everywhere hashtag in your post, anyone that completes all seven booths will be entered into a drawing to win a seat of Mastercam Mill. And you have until September 15th, which that is Thursday, to complete the contest. Oh, you have to tag the partner as well. But I would just down, download this PDF and read through it. If you have any questions on it, come to the, our booth. It's E3340, which is if the two main halls, like where the auto show is. You go over the bridge over Lakeshore. And that's, it used to be called the Lakeside Center. Now it's the East Building. And we're right in the center of that building. And you'll see the big Master Camp sign hanging from the ceiling. And we can help, help you guys with this if, if you want to try to win a seat. But the winner is going to be announced at the other item we have on this page, which is the Customer Appreciation Night that Thursday. So it's from 5 to 8 p.m. at the Hyatt Regency, which is the hotel that's connected to McCormick Place. And um, we'll be giving away um, some other swag there. Dave Canigliero from Mastercam Corporate, who's the Mill Tool Pass manager. We'll be doing a tips and tricks section, and he always has some cool stuff that even like us dealers don't know about. But the winner of that event will also be announced there. But it's always a good way to get, get together and meet some of your other Mastercam peers and all the people from corporate that you know, make the software actually happen. That's my IMTS spiel. So let's get into, so that's kind of all the general stuff on the interface. Let's get into what I call some of the system enhancements. We'll talk about analyzing and a few other items that have been added to 2017 here. I don't think there's been any questions yet either, so we'll keep rolling. What time are we at, Ryan? Okay, so we're pretty much on time. So we did add some new shading options into 2017. There's... Um, like a metallic, there's a glossy, there's a plastic um, sort of way to view view the files. You know, that's more for eye, eye candy or sending a model to a customer or something like that. You know, I don't know how many people use it at, actually in practice. 
because we really revamped the way the solids look and the edge highlighting on the solids, I think back in X7. And it's basically a progression of that as we try to continue, continually improve the graphical view of models and solid models like that in the software. And there's a, an, an example of some of the different ways a part can look. So we also redid the level manager in 2017. And it's dockable. It's part of the rest of the operation manager area in the software. So let's just go into 2017 here, and I'll show you. So you have your levels pane here. And if you go into like the README after you install 2017, at the very bottom, there will be a, a section called depreciated functions. And that's basically functions that have either been replaced or gone away. And you know, we're not going to remove any core stuff like tool pass and things like that. Some of those wireframe tool pass and stuff necessarily aren't in the ribbon. But through the customization menu, you can pick the pull down that says commands not in the ribbon and then add them to an existing tab or create a new tab of some of those functions. So in your level manager here, you have the same levels as kind of how they were viewed before. You can still split this off onto another screen or window if you want and always have it open, which is I think we added that in X9 to basically make the levels always on. And creating new levels is with the plus button here. You have some other options here to you know only display the active level, you can contrast the rows, just some other view options here. You can hide the level properties if you have a lot of levels, so you're not seeing that the options at the bottom to name them different ways. Uh, you can turn levels all on and off, or you can reset the levels, and it will prompt you if you try to reset everything. You can find a level based on geometry. Was, was that an X9, Ryan? I can't remember. But you basically click that search bar there, and then you click any geometry on your screen, and it'll highlight or make that level active where that geometry is. And then lastly, if you right-click here and say change level, that's how you pick entities to move around to different levels in 2017. My mic's not picking up Norbert, is it? OK, so a couple things. Um, if you guys are like any of us here, I'll get to that after this slide. Um, you probably have multiple sessions of Mastercam open throughout the day. And every time you try to open another session, it would pop up with that thing saying, oh, this isn't supported. You may lose data, yada, yada. So Part of the last dealer conference, that was one of the things we, we brought up was, you know, everyone's using multiple sessions of Mastercam. You know, we've, we've never gone to what we call a multi-document interface like SolidWorks. And that's mainly because of the way that work offsets and, you know, actually creating G-code works to make things reliable. And so people don't get confused on like what job setup or work setup is set up for that particular file. But you can open multiple sessions now and the error won't pop up and we've done pretty extensive testing to ensure that you know no files that are used across sessions can corrupt anything. And one other thing, and I didn't really understand this when they first told me in the what's new file, but after some trying it out, I think it's pretty handy. So if any of you guys use the operations files, where say you program something a certain way, you save it out as an operations file, so the next time you run into a part or a way you want to use something, like say it's a 3D tool path that you've spent forever customizing the step down, step overs, tooling, all that stuff, you can save to an operations file. And before you'd have to right click in the operations manager, kind of go through an old school Windows browse interface, pick the operation, finally import it, and then start the tool path. Well, now you can basically have the folder open of all your different operations files and drag and drop them into the ops manager. And it'll pop up right away with basically select your geometry to apply to this pre-made operation. And then you're off, off to the races. So basically, this saves a lot of time for those people that are taking advantage of those operations files. And I can't stress 
trying those out enough because I don't see very many people using them. And like when I demo the software, I always show people that because it can really cut down on day-to-day -day sort of mundane operations where you're doing the same thing over and over again and maybe the part has just changed a little bit, but you want to use the same tooling and all the other data that you've put into it as a machinist and basically not having to reinvent the wheel every time you have to program something. We've also gone to a general file extension and we've kind of gone back and forth with this over the X versions. Like when X first came out and X2, it was just an MCX file format. And then we got user feedback saying that people didn't know what version files were. But now that more and more companies move to higher end ERP systems or like a vault type system, where you're trying to track files throughout the shop and assign files to different programs. It was kind of a pain every version, you'd have to reset those up for whatever the new extension was. So now file extensions are just a .m .mcam file. And if you try to open, like we have the 2018 alpha version now, if you try to open like a 2018 file in 2017, it'll just say, hey, this file was created in a newer version of Mastercam and it'll put in parentheses what that version is. And then you have the option to just bring in the geometry which is how that's always worked in the past anyway. Now, the other thing that we've updated similar to, way, to the way the levels manager was updated is the planes tab. So as opposed to the planes being at the bottom of the interface, it's now in the same left-hand manager here. And I have all my different ways to organize the planes, but then my create plane functions are all under this plus button here. So if I create the plus button here, I can uh, create planes from geometry, solid face, from normal, create planes dynamic. And uh, that's all similar to how it worked in X9. But really the easiest way I think to create planes in 2017 is if you hover over the XYZ nomen, and I'm not sure if it'll show up in the webinar here, but uh, it'll highlight blue a little bit and you'll get a little kind of the finger drag icon, like when you're in an internet browser. And if you just drag that away, it right away kicks you into the dynamic planes function. And then you can set a new WCS any way you want and start manipulating it from there. So I thought that was kind of a cool little shortcut they added to 2017 to basically create planes on the fly. Then you also have all your lathe planes here. You have your search function, set things equal. Like if I go back to top view and click equal, it'll set everything back. That was similar in the planes menu in X9. And you also have, uh, there's this little G view icon with an asterisk here. And if my graphics view is the same as the rest of my view, it'll put a little star there and kind of snap to whatever that view is. So if I'm set to say like a right hand view with a horizontal machine and I switch my graphics view to that, I'll know then that my graphics view is the same way that my world coordinate system is set up. So I'm not trying to think about what necessarily plane I'm in, just that I'm in the correct orientation to create some programs or create some additional geometry. So that's just what I was talking about here with the interactive nomen. So that bottom left hand, like I was talking about, is basically a dynamic plane function. And you just click and drag it and drop it wherever you want to create a plane. And one other thing that I always turn on in the interface here, and you'll notice I have a C plane in the top left, and then I have my T plane in the top right here. So if I go to File, Configuration, and then I believe, Ryan, it's on the screen tab or no, the, the C and T planes. Yeah. Oh, okay. There we go. So that's, that's where you turn, turn these on to, to get those to, to display in the corners. So I, I always set that up when I first start using Mastercam and then I always forget. Okay.
And then, okay. Can you drag and drop tool paths between different sessions of Mastercam yet? Okay, Ryan answered that. Okay. Yeah, you can do the export import to the operations files and then have the operations files open in your file browse menu and uh, then you can drag and drop them from there. And I see Tom Lobo has his hand up. Uh, I don't know if he had a question or not. But feel free to type it in if you do, Tom. So let's get in a little bit to the design solids updates we did to 2017. How, how am I doing on time? Okay. We're pretty good on time here. So I'm going to go over some of the solids functions here that we've added for 2017. And so if you guys noticed in X9, a lot of the solids functions moved over to the left-hand side of the screen as opposed to being in the ribbon bar. That was kind of the first steps to us getting into this 2017 interface. And we've moved uh, anything else that was in that Sketcher ribbon bar over to the left-hand side for 2017. So if I go to like a, uh, and I think you guys saw this at the beginning of the webinar, but if I create line endpoint here, it now moves the menu over to the left-hand side. And the settings are the same as they were in 2017. If I, um, depending on the command, if I go to like fillet entities here, it'll give me kind of a really big tool tip of what that particular function is and how it creates it and what the settings are. And you, you know, if you're a super power user, you're, you can turn those tool tips off if they're starting to get in your way. And we'll be moving other commands over as well as the software progresses, but we really wanted to get all those wireframe items moved over for 2017 as it wasn't, as that ribbon bar has gone away for this release. So the file I've had up on my screen the whole time, unless they're showing the software as opposed to watching the video because they're kind of choppy on the webinar. But one of the features we added, like a lot of customers have been giving us feedback saying that they're getting scan data. And sorry, I think you guys might be getting some feedback from people in the front office. We're in our lobby here. But, uh, or in the conference room, I should say. But if you're getting scan data from like the master 3D gauge or like a CMM or something like that, if we go to analyze on the home tab here and analyze, this is some, some port data we, we got from the master 3D gauge, you'll, you'll see that there's 295 points to create that spline. Now, if I were to create surfaces out of this, you know, it's, it's not gonna like that many control points for, for a given spline. So if I go to my wireframe tab, and then over on your modify section over here, you have a new function here called refit fit spline. Now there's the old functions are still under there too, like simplify spline, untrim, and simplify um, really only worked for circular shaped splines, not necessarily you know something with more complex geometry. So if I click on refit spline here, and let's pick that first one we did where there were 295 points. I can say OK, and your green check mark or the uh, red circle with a line through it is now moved to this section of the interface run right under the auto cursor selection menu. But I can say OK, I've picked that spline. I can say OK. Now I can either keep or delete the original geometry, but let's just say delete it. I can add a deviation tolerance to it and like what the angle or blend is, and then I can just say OK. And basically what it'll do is since I edited the geometry, it'll now turn it red. But if I go back to my analyze, or I can go back to my recent functions here and say analyze, I can pick that spline and you know now there's only 28 control points controlling that spline. And if I click this button here, which is edit control points, it'll, it'll show me basically how it created that refit of the spline. You still have to pick the X and Y line when creating your zero point. I 
just to respond to everyone for that one, Ryan. That pull down at the bottom. So um, some updates we've done to the bounding box and job setups. One of the requests we got was when you're creating a bounding box, you weren't able to anchor it to the basically the theoretical center of a model. So if you have, like the example we have here, a, a big aerospace part, you want to know kind of where the center is physically. It we don't do center of mass as we don't have you know mass properties of the geometry there, but it also creates center points on the edges of the model as well, which just allows it to kind of create things more quickly when doing setups or work holding or really anything like that. So if I take this bounding box and drag it into here and bring in that solid. I don't have my view sheets turned on. So this is kind of an, like an aerospace rib part. I think we did this as a demo part over at Toyota in Arlington Heights last year. But I can go onto my wireframe tab and click bounding box. And this was added in X8 or X9. And I'll show you guys some of the differences that are there. So I picked the solid that I want to create the bounding box off of. And this works for stock setup as well. Now I can pick these faces, which is was already in the software. And I can edit the size of the bounding box. But what we added here is you can set the center of the bounding box based off of the center of the part. So if I expand any of these size values, it'll do it proportionally. And then I can also turn on the option here to create a center point. And if I say OK, and I, I'm not creating a solid here. I'm, I'm just creating the wireframe. And say OK. Then I basically have the bounding box like we had before. But if you want to get this center point, for example, you would have to draw from the midpoint of these lines and then trim the geometry away and create a point there. So this is kind of a time-saving tip to uh, create the center points on various outer faces of your bounding box. And this one I'll probably do in the video because I think it's a little easier to see and it's just some wireframe geometry. But uh, basically what it does is when we had the dynamic gnomon before, you can use the auto cursor to kind of edit the way the dynamic gnomon works. And we added the options for doing uh, horizontal vertical orientation of the gnomon as well as tangent, which you didn't have that option before in X9. It was one of the, actually really the only auto cursor function that wasn't available for the dynamic gnomon. So you'll notice in the video here, now that I set that to tangent only, as I drag my mouse around, it will only orient the cursor to the tangent point of that particular arc. And if I set it to, to vertical, it basically works the same way. Now, I did get some feedback at the Illinois rollout on, I didn't set that up in my auto cursor before I went into the command, and now I'm kind of stuck and I have to exit back out of the command and do it again. But what I've kind of found as I was playing around with this was it's kind of a tip. Um, so if you're in the dynamic cursor, for example, I customized my right click menu and I added the auto cursor in my right click. And so this allows me to get to the auto cursor functions without exiting a specific command. So if you go into the customize up at the top, like we were talking about before, you look for auto cursor. And you can add that to your right click menu. And then you can always get this auto cursor settings to pop up, even if, because like, for example, when I have the auto cursor up, I can't click up in my selection bar here to pick my auto cursor options. Like it just doesn't let me. But if I put it under my right click, I can always have that available to switch the way that my auto cursor works. Oh, and one other thing I missed on this transform here is we added some, dy some dynamic functions to the traditional transform commands. So let's go to my transform tab. And then as opposed to using dy dynamic, let's use like the old translate that's always been in the software. Now I'll select an entity to translate. Let's just say we want to move this line of the bounding box I created. I can say, okay. 
Now, before I was stuck with entering these values, and if I wanted to move it, you know, up in Z, I think we're in metric, let's say 50 millimeters, it would move it up there, and then I could kind of get an idea of where it's going to be. But now in 2017, I still have these arrows, so I can move them over, they'll snap to these positions. And just like anything when you're in dynamic, if that little tan box is up there with the 200 millimeters, I can type in a different value. So if I type in 250 and hit enter once, it'll give me the preview and highlight it in blue. Enter again accepts that movement. So now if I set it, I have it set to copy, I can say apply, and then I can move it again, and, and then continue to use these dynamic functions to even use a standard transform. But you'll notice transform only allows you to move an XYZ. Um, so it locks that gnomon to kind of a simplified gnomon state as, as far as moving the geometry around, like you don't have your rotate commands necessarily available um, unless you edit or go into the dynamic transform. And that's available for all these transform commands now where the, you'll get the little XYZ or a specific gnomon to that transform command. We also updated the way solids disassemble worked. Um, if you guys would remember back from when we first introduced the feature, it would kind of lay everything out in a straight line. And that was still kind of a pain, like if you always program off the origin or you only need to program off of one of the parts, you'd have to kind of find it and delete all the other stuff out. And that's probably, this is an easier one to see in the video because it's not going too fast. But basically what you can do as opposed to moving everything out in space, you can organize it by level. So what it's going to do is put everything at the origin point and then just kind of stack them all on top of each other. And you can organize them that way or you can still organize them the previous way, which was by size or distance where to lay it all out in like an X or a Y sort of plane. And it's pretty straightforward. The only tip on this is you want to make sure you set it to at origin on levels before you edit any of the other functions. Because once you set it to at origin on levels, it'll basically gray out this automatic placement function, which is the way it worked before, where it laid it out like in Y plus or Y negative and so forth. And also before the undo before, say you had a thousand solids in an assembly and you click the undo button, it would only move one of the thousand. So you'd have to click undo literally a thousand times in order to get back to where you started. Well, now it's all this under the single function. So if you click undo, it moves everything back to the way the assembly was originally arranged. And my last tip there is too, is we get a lot of calls and emails and stuff. A guy will say, hey, I got an assembly from a customer. I open it up and it says no solid data found. It's just a blank file. I can't find any of uh, the geometry, what's up with the translator, and so forth. Well, uh, an assembly file is just a pointer to all the other solids that are contained in the assembly. Because if you ever notice, I'll use SolidWorks as an example, an assembly file might only be 800 kilobytes, even though it's an assembly of a car, for an example. Well, that's because all it is is basically a simple file that's pointing to all those other files. So if someone does send you an assembly, they should uh, package all up all the other SLD PRTs or whatever CAD system it was to bring in all that other solid data that you can actually tool path off of. So the next one, if you guys have ever used like the Boolean command in our solids tools, you knew it could be kind of finicky and you had to be real specific if you wanted to get like the inverse of a model and the wireframe had to be at a certain point and it had to be either slightly bigger or slightly smaller than the model. I can't remember offhand. So we added a new function in here called solid impression. And let me just go into the software. I think this is a better one to see actually in there. Back up to where was my folder? Of? Here we go. Solid impression. back to English. So I have kind of a casting part here and I have a couple wireframe boxes drawn and the only rules here really is the wireframe has to be above 
the level of the part. So I go to solids, and then it's right next to Boolean because it's similar to that command. I click on impression. Now it's going to ask me to select a chain for that impression. So let's just do the full model at first to start here. And now it says select the solid body to imprint or select a face on the solid to specify the maximum distance. Well, we'll, we'll try that one out in a second. Let's just do the whole body. So I'll turn face off, leave just body on, and pick the solid here. And before we do that, let me edit my solid color before we accept the command so you guys can see the difference here. Let's make it like, I'm trying to think what will show up well on the GoTo meeting, like a medium green color. Say OK. And it'll go ahead and calculate pretty quickly. And we've tried this on all different sizes and shapes of parts, and it seems to work pretty fast. Now, a shortcut here is Alt-E. It'll tell me it's something to keep on the screen. And I can say OK. So I'm basically getting the inverse of that model quickly and e easily. Now, you know, it's not going to, people were talking about this as far as creating electrodes. You know, there isn't like a shrink function in there yet. You know, that's probably an, an enhancement request that's already been made with corporate. But uh, what I always tell people as well, since it's Mastercam and you're doing 3D tool pass, you can just do, you know, negative stock to leave if you need to do some overburn or something like that. So if I hit Alt-E again, I can bring everything back. And let's do the undo. So it also works on, on partial parts of the model. So if I click on Impression again, pick that smaller chain. Now let's just try to do it to a particular face. We'll do it, say, to this face here. Now, depending on the complexity of the model, it'll give you different, basically, what's possible and not possible with the parasolid kernel, because we're basically at the mercy of Dassault systems on how it creates those solids. So let's try it to only go up to the space. Yeah, that, that one worked. I think it typically has to be a, a radius space in my trial and error with using this function. But if I click Alt-E here, it's only going to do within that smaller wireframe I selected. And it's only going to be part of the model that, that touch that specific area. So it also can be handy for doing partial functions to create work holding or you know some custom jaws and things like that. So we're also, now that we've gone and added those model prep commands over the past couple versions, part of that technology is also cleaning up solid models. So you guys might remember the product we carry called Space Claim. And you know, this isn't quite there yet if you're doing a ton of geometry repair, but it does help as far as simplifying maybe some dirty geometry that, that you got from a customer. So it can also help reduce the file size as well. So let me bring up the example I have. So I have a solid that was, uh, I can't remember where I got it from. I think it was just a demo part that I had. But um, I basically played the telephone game as exporting and importing it through STEP and IGIS. And just basically trying to get the solid to not be as clean as it was when it was originally created in whatever CAD system. So if I go to the Analyze tab here and zoom in on here, you'll notice you know, I got some kind of weird faces going on. If I pick on these radiuses here, you'll see it's broken up into a bunch of little different sections. And you know, if you're using like the solid linking chaining that was added, you know, it can be kind of a pain when you get a model like this. You, know, you have all these extra little faces and things like that. So if I go into my model prep menu here, and it is under optimize, and it's basically geared around do, doing the solid body as a whole. So I pick on the body, and like all the model prep commands, undo is not available because you're actually modifying the core data of the solid. So I always say if you are going to use this function to save the file beforehand, especially if you've been working with it for a while or something like that. So I can say OK. It'll analyze the solid and optimize it. And it won't give you kind of a full preview of what it's going to be doing, but it will hi highlight some of the areas where it did make modifications to the solid, both by faces, by highlighting them in yellow, and then any edges of the solid, it'll highlight in this blue color here. 
So it'll kind of show you areas that it's fixing, and then it'll give you a total number of optimizations that it made. So if I go back into my Analyze tab here, and I highlight this, you'll, you'll see that it cleaned up those arcs. I don't have those little weird faces over here anymore. And like these faces are now a single solid face and the radiuses are all blended properly. So if it's kind of a handy tool just to clean up things and if you're getting solids from customers, especially if it's like a step file where it was probably translated from something else, I always now got, got into the habit now that 2017 is out to run that right away to see if I can make any optimizations to you know, a quote unquote dumb solid that doesn't have like the history from SolidWorks or something like that. So we also added, and I won't go into the software for this because it's pretty simple, but we've had the clearance fillets for a long time, but we've now also added relief fillets where I think it took three or four commands in X9 to create a fillet of this particular style. But basically, it's a single-sided relief fillet on any wireframe geometry. And it's just another option if you go under the fillet command here, which is under wireframe, and then fillet, it's a relief right here. So let's get into a little bit on the Mastercam simulator. Are there any... Ant questions we didn't get to or you didn't answer to everybody okay so we're going to talk about some improvements to the simulator so if you guys remember back in x7 we basically rewrote the simulator from the ground up you know long story short the company that we originally uh, leased that software from back in gosh i think version 8 from like 98 um they decided to change the way their software worked and as opposed to being reliant on another product, you know, we always like to kind of develop our stuff in in-house and basically try to try to make it better. And I, I know we've had some growing pains over the years, but we're trying to make this as efficient and as useful as possible. So we're always trying to improve and add different functions to the simulator. So let me bring up a file that I have some tool pass on that has all the kind of bells and whistles I can show you here. So I have just kind of a casting part with some multi-axis trimming. I think this was a UMC demo we did at a, at a Haas day a while ago. But if I go back into the PowerPoint here, I'm gonna talk about some of these functions like printing's been added. So the fixture support. So I believe X9 added the fixture support, but you were stuck to having anything that's assigned as a fixture on a single level and if you're like me and you organize your file by levels you know that can be kind of a pain to move something from a level that you have organized to group everything together and kind of ruin your organization so in your tool path manager here you know you have your back plot verify and then right to the right of there is your back plot and verify options and that's where we get into the settings for how the simulator works so you have your how your stock is used and a lot of people don't know this as well they'll say hey i'll get into the simulator and my stock doesn't look like how it is how i set it up based off of let's say a stock model so you want to make sure like here i'm using a casting i want to make sure that i turn on that i'm using the stock model as my display in the simulator and then i can go over to the fixtures tab here and, and as opposed to being stuck on a single level i can turn on different levels, I can pick from individual solids, or if I have an STL model, for example, I can pick a specific file to use as my fixture in the simulator. But I have these organized by levels, so I have my UMC table and also my Raptor vise. So I have my stock set up as well as my fixtures. So I can say okay, and then I can go into the simulator. And like in previous versions, it does run in a separate window, so you can leave this open all the time. And so now I have that work holding set up, as well as my casting model from the stock model that I created. And it was actually kind of a cheater stock model. You can tell a stock model to just add a specific amount of distance on top of a given solid. 
to kind of create geometry where it maybe not be there. Like if you didn't get the casting model from the customer, you can just add some additional stock to a stock model so it actually shows some material removal in Verify. So that's the fixture support. Uh, we now have an auto start option. I have it turned off um, because I'm not necessarily doing large files all the time. But basically what it does is before when I say, let's say I had a big 3D tool path where the NCI file was 30 megabytes, it, it wouldn't start playing the simulator tool motion until it loaded that entire NCI file. And this is on by default with 2017, but I'll show you guys where it is. If you click on the file menu and then go to options, I have a couple things in here. I always tell people to turn on the five axis engine, even if you have a three axis machine, because for example, the three axis is only looking from a vertical orientation. So if you're removing material on like the edges of a part, it necessarily won't simulate that. It's just gonna simulate what it sees from the top. And so it has this enable auto start. And what we added in X9 as well is what's called the adaptive quality, which if you go to the verify tab and do the accurate zoom, the adaptive quality is basically doing the accurate zoom on the fly. So if you're running on like a laptop, for instance, like mine, you know, I have a two-year-old laptop with I think a Quadro 2000. So, you know, it's a, a mid-range as far as specs are concerned. I leave that adaptive quality turned off just so it runs a little faster. But that auto start will basically start playing it as soon as it gets any NCI data into the simulator, it'll start running the operation. So now we also have a recording option. So a lot of people would always ask me, you know, how, how do I send a simulation to a customer without necessarily using like the module works full simulation and you'd have to use a screen recording tool like Camtasia or similar. So we added it right into the verify interface. You have the record button here and then you have, and this is on the home tab of the simulator. So you have record and then you have your recording option. So you can do high, medium or low quality. The high will basically be the same as whatever your screen resolution is up to 1080p and you can record the full window which is the entire simulator interface if you turn full window off it's just going to be the graphics screen where like the my gray gradient is and you can tell it to record audio or not and what it'll do is it'll save an mp4 formatted file to your computer and that's an easy file to either share or they, they can get big in size pretty quickly, especially if you're recording at 1080p, but it is an easy format to basically drag and drop into YouTube or similar. We added printing to the simulator, works basically the same way that printing works in regular Mastercam. You can kind of drag and move the view around like you can, you can't edit the like angle or like isometric orientation of the view, but you can move kind of how it, how it fits on the screen. So a couple of things here, we're getting towards the end of actual slides I have. What time is it, Ryan? I can never see with the PowerPoint. So it's only a quarter after 11, but that's all I had as far as the interface and simulator and all that, but let me go over some housekeeping stuff first. And then since we're done a little early here, which I kind of thought we would be, I'll get into some of the tips and tricks I did at the in-person rollouts. So you guys can hopefully get a little more out of the webinar today if you set this time aside. But if you need to bounce, that's okay. This I'll continue recording and it'll be up on our website. But we are hosting 2017 update classes. These are free for maintenance customers. And you'll notice our next one is coming up Friday, September 16th. That is the Friday of IMTS, but uh, we still have five spots open. So it's basically a one day class. We'll be going over a lot of what I talked about today. We'll be going over both lathe and mill tool pass. And uh, Scotty from our office teaches that. 
And we're basically going to keep hosting them until people stop coming. We, we did something similar when X first came out. But, you know, really our main goal is that people are comfortable and using 2017. So I recommend taking that class. If we go back to the 2017 downloads page, let's talk about that make the switch PDF training. So it's real simple. I think it's only you have 20 pages. And it basically walks you through a lot of what I talked about today. You know, what's the interface? What were the menus in X9? How do they look in 2017? And really kind of going through a lot of the differences to how the interface works, how to customize the interface, how the toolpath menus work. And it's basically kind of a quick crash course to get the system set up and running with 2017. There is also the demo for 2017 is now available or what they call the home learning edition. If you go to support, downloads, Mastercam demo and home learning edition, I used to have this link active, but I was getting a lot of basically spam from other countries that were either trying to download it or trying to access the website so many times that it was maxing our bandwidth. And so now it's just a form. If you fill out the form, it, it goes basically right to me and I send you the link on how to download it. But it's basically a fully featured uh, version of 2017. It just saves as an educational format and it doesn't post out and it dimensions to one decimal place. But you can open up regular Mastercam files and continue to practice with them. And it's just a good um, learning tool. I think that's all the housekeeping I had. Let's go to, uh, I think I have it on, yeah, here we go. I have it as a Google presentation. Let's close out of my PowerPoint. So some tips and tricks. Uh, I, I actually talked about this in the webinar today, but that's adding a contextual tab to your so let's say mill and I have that on that 2017 downloads page that we talked about at the beginning of the webinar. The next item I have here is and this was actually a question I had to the tech guys and then it ended up getting put in like our reseller tech talking that they call it that's released every month um, where it's kind of tips and tricks and different things kind of going on from a support perspective of Mastercam. So whenever I would use the OptiRough toolpath, which I think is really useful as far as, you know, this quick and easy 3D roughing, I would always fool with my step downs to get it to machine an extra pass at the very bottom of a pocket, for instance, even though my distance wasn't necessarily set up to machine all the way to the bottom. So I have like a half inch step down here, but I only have, you know, a quarter inch of material left to cut. So it, it would not machine the entire pass. Well, kind of the workaround or shortcut to that is you turn on the step up, but you make it the exact same value as the step down. So it, it doesn't necessarily add any additional cuts except at the very bottom of the 3D tool path. So no matter what that distance is between your final step down and the bottom of the part, it will add an extra intermediate cut between like that half inch step down, for example, that, that we have set in, in this example here. Uh, someone's asking about the transition guide. And so since we got the webinar going here, let me just show you where that is. So if you want to look for the transition guide, if you click the start button, go to all programs, and then go to Mastercam 2017, you're going to have kind of the main stuff here where it's the Mastercam, check for updates, code expert, tool manager, the what's new. But if you go into documentation, uh, the, admin, the administrator guide is for like setting up a NetHasp, installation, silent installs. The installation guide is more for a single user installation. There's the quick reference card that comes in like the 2017 box. Um, and then you have your transi transition guide here which that'll basically walk you through migrating, talking about how we can bring over the key mapping file and kind of showing you how the migration works. The migration wizard works exactly the same as it did in X9. It's just in that 
Um, if I go into Mastercam here, it's under File, Convert, and then Migration Wizard. And then that's how you get to it. So getting back to some tips here. Uh, we were getting a couple reports when 2017 came out that file save is kind of slow. And this has to do with some, basically the way that Windows is handling the files now that we're using that new back end as far as the interface is concerned. But let's say I go into my files here and I'm usually in the detail view, but if I go into let's say a extra large icon view, I'm getting a, basically the way my graphic screen was right when I hit the file save menu. So like for this file, for example, if I have it oriented like this and then click file save, that's what this little screenshot is gonna be in my file browse menu. And it's also gonna appear in, if, if you have your preview pane turned on. But if you're like me and use the detail view, and I sometimes have the preview pane turned on depending on what I'm doing. Um, if you go into the system config, so it's under file, configuration, and then it is under the files tab. You can basically say un uncheck this include bitmap file when saving. So if you have really small solids or an assembly with a lot of solids, it's basically taking little captures of all those as you hit file save and can increase the file save time. Um, if you have a solid state hard drive, like we all recommend, you typically won't see this, but if you're still running a spinning hard drive, it can speed up your file save immensely and you won't be wanting to flip your desk over. That bitmap won't be there, but um, if you have your files named accordingly, it will work. So I was talking about at the beginning of the webinar about the manufacturing tool libraries, and Mastercam added a new part to their website actually just a couple weeks ago, and it's called the Mastercam Tech Exchange. And if I go to the link here, it's under the Communities tab, and uh, or you just Google Mastercam Tech Exchange and it's there. So it's going to be used for a couple of different things. We're going to have tool libraries on here. So anytime um, different manufacturers, like we've already added a couple since this first came out, like August 1st is when everything first got updated. But like Iskar updated their holders a couple of weeks ago. So we have a brand new version of that tool library available on this website. So basically getting closer and closer to having that, in, that integration with the tool manufacturers. And we're hopefully getting more and more on board. If any of you guys remember Chris or Dave from our office, they're part of a new team at Mastercam Corporate that are basically OEM liaison. So they work with the machine tool manufacturers as well as the tooling manufacturers to basically have a more community approach to manufacturing and the way software integrates with their equipment. And we're hopefully going to be announcing some things soon. I'll have to find out more at IMTS actually of some of those integrated, you know, cloud-based tool libraries and things like that. But this is at least kind of a stopgap where you can get the tooling manufacturer data in a more real-time sort of setup. They're also going to have sample files and posts on here. But, you know, being Shopware customers, I would still get a hold of Norbert if you need a post. We also have request forms on our website under support. Mastercam posts, Oops, my mouse would work today. And then you have all the different requests for them. So mill, five axis, lathe, and so forth. Yeah, it's still shy of 1130. Uh, one other thing on here, if you guys are using live tool lathes, this actually popped up in X9, the way we handle the verify engine. If you have live tools, for example, and you're doing a pocket on one side of the part, and then you transform that operation to the other side of the part, the simulator might show a crash. But if you look at the G code or um, like a machine simulation, it's just fine. You know, your, your retracts were programmed fine. You're confused as to why it's showing it and verify. 
Well, um, basically what the way the setting is, and it's in the control definition, and I won't spend too much time on this. If you guys are seeing it, you know, give us a call and we can show you how to, or if you know how to navigate the control definition, it's pretty easy to find, but you go to the machining tab, go into the machine def first, and then go into the control definition, and it's going to be set on the, on the motion control tab of the tool pass. So let me show you that for the guys that are curious. So if I go to, go to machine, machine definition. Oh, I'm trying to edit a UMC that I don't have currently loaded. But it's basically set to each axis moves at each feed rate independently without getting too technical. It's basically trying to get to the next location as fast as possible. You want to set it to what's called linear interpolate at maximum feed rates, and then it's going to read the axes independently and will simulate your retracts properly. But we can talk, if any of you guys are experiencing that, the last rollout I was at, everyone was looking at me like I was crazy and didn't ever run into it. So give us a call if you're having that problem. We also now have the Mastercam translators on the web publicly. Before it was a dealer file, I don't know why, but this is an easy way for you guys to see or your IT to see what are the current supported translators because we're basically reliant on the CAD companies. For example, SolidWorks comes out with 2017. They then give us access to, to develop the translator for their most recent version. So Mastercam 2017 added AutoCAD 2017 support, um, and SolidWorks 2016 support actually came in update three of X9. If any of you guys are still running X9, I can't wonder why you can't open up a brand new SolidWorks file. You need to make sure that you are on update three. My final tip, and one of the rollouts I was at, some people raised their hand and said they are using them already, but as people move towards higher and higher resolution, like if you get a 4, 4K monitor, uh, I think Norbert here has, has one now, you know, you can get a ton of real estate on a single screen and, you know, you need to mess with some settings in Windows or else, like your desktop icons are the size of a eraser head and you can't see anything. But if you go into your file options or right click and customize the ribbon in Mastercam, customize the ribbon and then go to the options tab, you have your option for large icons here. And it's really only for the operations manager because since the icons are so much bigger in the tabs up here, there isn't really a need to make those any bigger, but these will make the manager panel icons bigger. And one other thing while I'm in here, by default, Mastercam is going to load with what's called the medium theme. I personally can't really see the difference. If I turn on medium theme, it's not a whole lot different from the dark. But you can edit the way the accent color is, so that backstage menu, as well as this menu across the bottom, I have it set to blue. I think default is gray. But the one thing in here, and we talked about the app look in X9, if you do switch it to black, it'll be kind of similar to how SolidWorks 2016 shipped the first time and everyone threw their arms up and I think Service Pack 1 of SolidWorks added back the old colors. But if you do go to black here and say, okay, Mastercam will go to kind of a fully dark interface. And I know Ryan, who's sitting here with me today, as well as Josh from our tech team, they, they run the dark interface. And I know some people like that. So if, if you want kind of a night mode for Mastercam, that's under the right click, customize, and then the options tab. And that's as all as I had as far as tips and tricks go. Um, and we are at 1130 on the knob. So let's see if we have any more questions. Dark rules. Yes, it does. But uh, as always, I want to thank you guys for attending. We will be announcing our Wisconsin rollouts here 
uh, if you know anyone that wants to come in person. The 2017 boxes for the physical, like the USB stick, um, some other, we got a new mouse pad in there. I think I have it on our Instagram page. Let's see, shop brand. Let's see. Um, just some swag to get. We're going to be shipping those out soon. Yeah. And then we're going to have some stuff at IMTS, giving away some stuff at the rollouts, like T-shirts. We got some mugs up for a raffle, some new pens. Uh, but the mouse pad and the USB key is what's going to be in the 2017 box. Those will be going out shortly as we got them finally all together. And as our new front office person starts, I think next week or the week after, we'll start getting all those shipped out to people that don't attend the rollout in person. But this will be on our YouTube channel. And I'm going to stop the recording for the YouTube.